Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to church this morning. Do you want to get your tea and coffee? Come this way. You guys want to stand up? We're going to get started with a time of worship, and I'm just going to pray before we do. And to all you online, you're also very welcome. God, uh, we thank you for today. We thank you for the beautiful sunshine that we had yesterday that just um, filled our spirits with joy, God. Um, as we come here this morning, Lord Father, we pray um, that we would know your peace, God, that we would know your presence in this time, Father. God, that as we worship you, Lord Father, God, we would find rest in you. And God, be reminded of the truths of who you are, Lord Father, and the truths um, of who you've created us to be as well, Jesus. In your holy and precious name, amen.
You call me out upon the waters, the great alone, where fear may fail, and there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise, my soul rests in your embrace For I am yours and you Presence of my face. 
Desperately, we were not just to spit that blood. And we walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. we thank you lord father god that when you call us out upon the waters lord father you take our hand god you don't call us out upon the waters to fall flat on our face and, um, and sink lord god when you call us out you're you're there lord father walking the waters with us lord father and what an honor and what a privilege that is lord father to know lord god that you walk with us you walk alongside alongside us lord father and you carry us when we can't walk anymore god God, thank you that we are held by you, Father. Thank you that we are your children, God. And God, a father never stops loving their children, God. Remind um, whoever needs that this morning, Lord, just to know that they are your child, Lord God. And God, Father, you're holding them right now, God. I thank you so much for your promises, which are true. Amen. You guys can take your seats. Um, we're going to go into a short time of communion, but um, just before we do, I suppose I was thinking of coming into this time, you know, every week we take the bread, we take the juice, we remember um, the sacrifice that um, God gave through his son. And um, sometimes we can do it so routinely, I think, that it's just, we do it every Sunday and we move on. But I think th this week I was just, I was picking the songs and stuff and uh, just the chorus or the bridge of that first song that we sang really stood out to me is, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you Oh Lord, and I will not be shaken. And just thinking of where have we built our foundations, you know, because like it, it take coming here for example on a Sunday. Every Sunday we come and it church. It's brilliant. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, we all, we should all be here, right? Um, but we can sometimes rely on it too much. I think like okay, we come on Sunday and we're built up for the week, and then we kind of our energy levels die down a little bit. But we'll be back next Sunday and we'll build ourselves up again. And sometimes I think we can use things in our lives as foundations. We can use church as a foundation. We can use our kids as a foundation. Or we have this really good job and everything's great because I have this really good job and I can provide and I can do X, Y, and Z. But what happens when all those things are taken away? What happens if tomorrow this building went up on flames and there was no more Elevate and there was no more church? Where would you be then? How would you cope? And I think just a reminder of, you know, like on Tuesday, when we're in the middle of the week and something goes wrong, where is your foundation? Where are you pulling from? Where is your worth coming from? And just for me this week was a reminder of, um, you know, if my foundation, if your foundation is not in Christ, everything feels like it's crumbling. So when problems come and when hardship comes, because they will come, um, in Scripture it tells us that, um, you know, trouble will come. Um, it, that's a fact of reality and a fact of life. But where is your strength coming from? Is it coming from your friendships or is it coming from, like, where is it coming from? And just as we, as the bread and the juice goes around and as you take it, maybe just pause for a second and honestly ask yourself the question, where is my foundation? Where am I looking to? when things go wrong. Because if it isn't God and it isn't Jesus and isn't the cross, um, everything else is eventually going to crumble and fade away. And that's a question I've had to ask myself over the last couple of months as well. And um, yeah, so I'm just going to pray if that's okay. God, thank you um, that in this life, Lord Father, we will have trouble. Because if we didn't have trouble, Lord Father, we wouldn't know our need or our dependence on you. Lord God, we wouldn't know the need for a savior, Lord Father, if everything was rosy um, and we would feel like we would be able to do it ourselves, God. So I just thank you for the things in our lives that are hard sometimes. Um, and God, I pray that each and every single person here, Lord Father, would be able to look to you in those times, God, to be reminded um, that your grace abounds, Lord Father. It's found in the deepest waters, Father. And God, your, um, your grace and your mercy, Lord Father, are met 
are immeasurable, God, and they are freely given, Lord Father. God, thank you that we are your children, we are held by you, Lord God, um, and that you're always approachable, Lord Father. And I pray this week, um, as we go into this week, Lord Father, that we would uh, honestly ask our question, that question, where is our foundation? And God, if it's not found in you, God, draw us closer to yourself so that it, do- it is, Lord God. We thank you for this morning and just be with us in your name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. How are we? Did you enjoy the summer yesterday? <laughs> it's the only bit you're going to get. <laughs> uh, before we kick off, let's, I just want to remind you, if you have a, a pen and paper with you or take out your phones, I just want to remind you the, the camps that are coming up this summer. Um, the kids' camp from ages 5 to 12 is going to be from July 19th to the 21st, and that's going to be at the church here. Um, so if you have any kids or want to invite any kids to it, uh, just let us know. We'll put the information up on the, the website too. Uh, also for our youth, 13 to 17, it's going to be from July 31st to August 4th. It's going to be at a CIY camp up in Kildare. So just let us know. Um, we'll, we'll get you all the info you need. Um, but after this service, we're going to 
pray about, about that camp. Or, so if your parents or um, you want to come up and pray with us, just or have questions even, after the service, we're going to meet up here at the, at the front after the service to, to pray for those camps and, and the youth ministry. Right, we're still in Galatians. Uh, chapter 4, we're going we're gonna to be kicking off in verse 16, but before we kick off, um, in case you're visiting or, or it's your first time with us, at the moment we're going through this book called Galatians, and it was written by this guy by, by the name of Paul, and he wrote to the, to the church because the church was up in a heap. It was going through this period of, of disruption, and it was going through a period where there was a ton of misinformation, and you know people were saying one thing, and they were doing another, and they believed this, and another group believed that, and any of you relate with this? Yeah, right? They were just up in a heap, right? The lovely thing is, not much has changed, right? So the church was just, it was up in a heap. So Paul wrote to the church to kind of give them a heads up. And he said, guys, we got to stay focused. We, we, we got to stay focused on the truth. And we got to stay focused on, on what Scripture says. Because as he was going, as he was looking at the church and as the church was progression, progressing, three things were happening within the church. The first thing that was happening is it was causing people to question their faith but not in a good way. It was causing people to doubt who God was. All this disruption that was going on was causing that. The second thing that it was causing is it was causing people to walk away from their faith. Do you remember in chapter one where Paul said, lads, I'm astonished at how many people are walking away. But the third thing it, it, it was doing was it was making the church and it was making Christ, it was making them look bad because what was happening was people outside, we'll say people who didn't believe in Jesus, we're looking at this group of people who claimed to believe in Jesus and said, lads, you behave worse than we do. And yet you want us to, to believe what you do when it doesn't even work for you. So the reputation of the church was online. The reputation of Jesus was online, on the line. So he's, he's writing and saying, lads, you got to get your act together. You, you, you got to get it together. Now, this is really encouraging. I find it really encouraging. The reason being is not much has changed. The lovely thing about Paul talking to us about the, the troubles or the disruptions within the church when he, when he was there, and we still have the same things today, is that he also gives us the solution. So we don't have to travel far, we don't have to read far to get to the solution to the problems that we still have today. It, it's a wonderful truth that, that Paul tells us was true back then and is true now, which is life is messy. People are messy. Church is messy. But before you go cleaning up someone else's mess, focus on yourself. Clean up your own mess before you focus on someone else's mess. <laughs> because when you just focus on other people's messes, things are only going to get messier. That's it. Things are just going to get messier. So last week, we talked how Paul desperately was trying to get people to gain perspective. That he's, he's requesting and he's asking people to, to step back before they engage and confront others, to take a look at yourself and reflect and think. And if there's a situation that needs to be attended, can you gain the perspective and look through the lens of eternity? To say in 10 years or 50 years or 1,000 years, is this going to matter? Is this, is this really going to matter? That can I look at it and take responsibility for my part of anything that happens and self-reflect and learn and not damage the name of Jesus in, in how I handle it? So I guess a way to kind of summarize it is, will my behavior in any conflict reflect my belief in Jesus? And that's something for all of us to think about. Will my behavior in any conflict or any disruption reflect who Jesus is? Now, Paul here is trying to drill this in. He's trying to drill the truth in, and he's pleading with people to listen to the truth. But people are being closed-minded, and, and he finds it hard because they won't listen. And again, same is true today. Pe people find it hard to listen. And let's, let's be honest, I certainly find it hard to listen. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's hard to hear the truth. And Paul is writing this, and he's willing to risk his reputation, and he's certainly willing to risk relationships in order to present the truth to people. But isn't it, it isn't what he believes in, and the truth, the same thing. Like, if I believe in something, doesn't that mean it's true? No. <laughs> There's a ton of stuff I believe that isn't true. I just don't know it's not true yet. There's a ton of stuff you believe is true, but you just don't know it's true yet. So we got to filter through and say, do I believe the truth or what I believe is it true? And how do I figure out if it's true? And that's the journey. That's what we're all on is trying to figure out what is it? What is it? Because there's the truth and then there's your opinion. 
Now, today, they'll tell you that's wrong. Society today will say what? Well, that's my truth. <laughs> there is no my truth. There's your opinion. There's my opinion, but there's the truth. There's just, there just isn't my truth. Multiple things can't be. So there has to be the truth. And this is where Paul is, is kicking off. So Paul's talking about this. He says the truth. What's the truth? The message of Jesus. So let's dig into this. So we're in Galatians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 16. So here's how Paul kicks this off. He says, have I now become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? What a way to start. <laughs> Have I now become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Well, what truth is Paul on about? He said, well, it simply says, what the truth is, you have to keep perspective of having Jesus at the center of your life. But then the truth of the gospel is that Jesus is the only son of God that died and rose again for your sins. And that's it. That's the core of the truth. That, that's the core gospel. I was trying to come up with a way to, um, to articulate this well this morning on, on how do we define what the truth is or how do we find the truth. And, and honestly, I could have just copied and pasted what I'm about to show you, but I think these guys do a much better job than I could and try to explain what exactly is, is truth. So take a quick look at this video. Ravi Zacharias is probably one of the greatest apologists in the world today. Oskin is a great author. R.C. Sproul, one of the great theologians of our time. We'll let them answer the question. The single most important question any human being can ask is the question, what is truth? One of the most basic questions of all is the question, what is truth? And, and there have been battles over the answer to that throughout the ages. Of all the issues today, you could boil them down to half a dozen, but unquestionably, truth would be major. So to answer the question, what is truth? I would say it is this, truth is that which affirms propositionally the nature of reality as it is. Truth is defined as that which corresponds to reality as perceived by God, because God's perception of reality is never distorted. It's a perfect perception of reality. So when Pilate looked at Jesus, he says, ah, what is truth, and walks away. Pilate walked away from the greatest authority on the greatest question and committed the greatest crime at that time. What a definition. <laughs> truth is defined as that which corresponds to reality as perceived by God. That's truth. See, you and I, we live in this messed up, fallen world. We don't see things as clear. God's reality is the truth because he's the only one who wasn't affected by sin. He's the only one who, who has true perspective of what things are. And I think, you know, truth isn't just not lying. We've we got to get this right. Truth isn't just not lying. Truth is who Jesus claimed to be. So it's not just a, a, a thing. It's a person. I mean, look, look at John 14, 6. It says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Or in John 8, it says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Truth is a person, and, and truth came in the form of, of Jesus. So Paul is asking, have I now become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Or another way to phrase it, have I become your enemy because I'm pointing you to Jesus? Have I become your enemy because I'm telling you, hey, th this is the way. Th this is how it, how it is. And if we all have to filter out the lies, how do we do that? All of us have to filter the lies, right? We, we all have information that mightn't be true, but we might want it to be true. But the only way we filter through the lies is to filter what we know through Scripture, through the Holy Spirit. Because as we filter it through Scripture, it purifies it and lets us know, am I right or wrong? Is what I believe right or wrong? And that, that's what we have to do. And absolutely, you know, wisdom is needed for this, but we all have to do it and not filter it through our fear or desires or, or wants. But do I, do I just look for what I believe and that's my reality or do I want the truth? Because it's easy to find what we want to believe, right? All, just, all that takes is Google. <laughs> and, you know, I, I may have to find whatever I want. Well, I, I choose to believe this because it's easier. So we have to be careful when we say, well, I, I, I do want the truth. We have to be very careful when we say that because the truth isn't always what we want to hear. Right? The, the, the truth can be hard to hear. Look how Paul, how Paul continues it in verse 17. He says this, uh, chapter 4, verse 17. Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor 
that their intentions are not good. They're trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. So they were trying to cut, cut uh, Paul out of the group. People who will only tell you what you want to hear, that, that's false teachers. See, if somebody isn't open to being questioned, that's your first red flag. Second red flag is when somebody isn't willing to listen. And just in case you need a third red flag, is when somebody isn't willing to be wrong. They're your red flags. And anybody, anybody can question stuff. You should question stuff. It's needed. Because if it's true, what will happen to the questions? Just dissolve. You can answer them. Right? Now, it's not that we know all the answers. Don't hear that. Right? But it's the journey of finding them out. But the thing is, you have to be willing to be able to ask the questions. See, false teachers will try to win favor and cause division. Why? To, to, to win control. That's why they want to do it. He says it here. He says, they're trying to shut you off from me so that you'll pay attention only to them. Why? Because they were telling them what they wanted to hear. Now, it's always lovely to hear what you want to hear, isn't it? It doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> you know, a real friend will kind of, they'll tell you the truth, but they'll tell you it in grace, right? Because you can hear the truth, but the timing of hearing the truth is just important. So it's telling the truth with, with grace. So they're trying to shut Paul, up, shut Paul out, but it sets us free, and, and that's what Paul is trying to get at. So it's really important that, that we draw close, that you and I draw close to that truth. Why? Because you and I will be able to identify the lie and challenge it when we know the truth. Timothy says this in, in 2 Timothy 4, he says, A time will come when people will not listen to the truth. They will look for teachers who, are, who will tell them only what they want to hear. That's frightening. Because people will selectively listen to what doesn't challenge them. I, I just want to, I just, uh, you know, we got to let that sit. See, it's a great question that you and I need to ask ourselves. It's not up on the screen. Write this down, right? Here's a good question to ask yourself. When was the last time I had to change a belief or behavior as a consequence of reading Scripture or through the Holy Spirit telling me? When was the last time you opened Scripture and said, dang, I got I to change a belief or a behavior because of what I'm reading? And if the answer is never or not in a long time, I want to submit to you, you might be reading it a little wrong. Because Scripture is everything we're not. God is everything we're not. And it affirms us absolutely. It affirms the security we have in Christ. But it should also challenge us. It should also be, be challenging us to change more into Christ's likeness. Because when we open the pages of Scripture, we, we're reading raw, unadulterated truth. We're reading it. It's up to us to absorb it. It's everything we're not. But it's everything that we should be drawn close to. Not, not just so that we can know the truth, but so that we can avoid the lies. And Paul goes on in verse 18. Here's what he says. If somebody's eager to do good things for you, that's all right. He says, but let them do it all the time, not just when I'm with you. So there's a, bit of, there's a bit of fickleness going on. He says consistency is one of the big indicators of truth. Because if it's true, it'll be true all the time. See, if you're truthful, you don't need to have a memory, right? Do you ever be with somebody and you know they're lying to you? And you can see them, da 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 <laughs> See, you're telling the truth. You don't need a memory. You can just talk. You know, but the thing is, when we build our life or, or we don't know what we believe, sometimes it's that little bit more of a struggle to, to get through things. But Paul says here, you need to watch out for people who love bomb you, who just smother you with love. But then as soon as everyone looks away, they'll abuse you. And then they'll smother you with love. And then they're mean to you. And then they'll smother you with love. <laughs> and he says, you've got to watch out for these people. He says, there's no consistency. He says, if you have fickle friendships, you're going to have a fickle faith. He says, you've got to have consistency in it. Now, any of you here with siblings know this is true. Because when your parents are around, you love each other. The second your parents turn your back, you thump the head off each other. <laughs> right? That's <laughs> what you do. <laughs> Every sibling does that. Or we've all worked with somebody when the boss is around. They're a hard worker. And the second the boss is gone... Uh, there, I see three or four of you looking at the floor. That's she. Yeah, that's the hero. <laughs> right? But that, see, consistency is key. But the same is true in our faith. We've got to be consistently loving people, not just when we're at church. There's no point in coming to church behaving one way, then going out behaving another way. He says, how, how do we consistently do this? But here, I love, <laughs> so Paul, Paul continues, but Paul here, man, he, I love it. Like, I love how Paul is just so honest. 
And you can read here how Paul is just getting worn out from the church. He's getting, he's getting a little annoyed with the church. And here's what he says in verse 19. He says, oh, I love how he starts off with oh. Right? He says, oh, my dear children, I feel like I'm going through labor pains with you again. And they'll continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Translate it. Why do I have to keep telling you the same thing over and over again? And this is Paul's frustration with the church. Like, he know this. He should know this. And, I, you know, I love how Paul shows his frustration because he says, why are we acting like children? Why is the church acting like children? He says, it's, it's kind of like I'm going to have to give birth to you every single day. He says, that's not what I want. And that's his fear is that I'm going to have to do this until, until Christ is fully developed. He says, I'm going to have to keep doing it. Because Christian maturity isn't how long you've been a follower of Christ. Christian maturity is measured by how you live out your faith each and every day. That, that's how it should be measured. There's a guy that I read quite a bit of. His name is Eric Erickson. He, kinda, he, he looks at um, developmental stages of children and stuff. Um, but he, he, you know, anyone who, who's ever gotten a diagnosis of something like whatever, autism or something, um, they, it's used, his stages are used to determine the developmental stages of people. And if somebody came into church and they're 10 years old and they weren't walking, your assumption would be there's something wrong, right? Because we all can assume you should be walking by 10 years old. So it's not a judgment and it's not like a anything. It's just a, it's a matter of fact. You should be walking by 10. But the same thing can be applied spiritually. That when we're followers of Jesus, we, we should have developmental stages. So if we're a follower of Jesus a long time, but we're still acting like children, Paul says there's something wrong with that. He said there, there's something wrong. We should be growing in our, in our faith. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, it says this, when I was a child, I spoke and taught and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, what did he do? Put the childish things behind him. So if we're followers of Jesus and we've been around a while, we, we should be acting more mature in our faith. What does that look like? Go to 1 Corinthians 12, fruit of the Spirit. We should be growing in those things. But Paul is writing to the church and saying, guys, what, what are you doing? What, what, what are you doing? See, if we're followers of Jesus, we, we should be putting childish things behind us. Otherwise, there's something wrong. There's something wrong if we're not. You're not developing spiritually. And he closes out with this in verse 20. Here's what he says. I wish I were with you right now so I could change my tone. <laughs> so you can see in his right, he's writing fairly harshly. He says, I wish I could change my tone. But at, at, a, at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. He says, I don't know how else to help you guys. You know, and I love how Paul is so honest in this because the truth is always going to point us towards Christ. And equally true is this, the truth will always challenge us to walk towards Christ. It'll always do that. That's what the truth does. It'll, it'll always point us towards Jesus. And if you're around people who don't help you find what the truth is, that's, that's quite dangerous because that you can easily be misled. How we feel mightn't be true. What we see mightn't be true unless we filter through what Scripture says. So I guess to, to close out the message, I have this, this one challenge, I suppose, this one thing that you might ask yourself. Write it on your bathroom mirror this week. It's this, am I open to hearing the truth? Am I open to hearing? Don't be quick to say yes, because we all have to dish out the truth. It's very hard to receive it. Don't be quick to say yes, because when you say yes, you have to be open to change, because there isn't one person in this room. There's nobody watching online. We all have changes to be made, all of us. But are we willing to hear and see what those changes are? Are we willing to challenge a belief we might have held for a long time? Are we open to being wrong? I was asked a question once, which I loved, which was, what do I currently believe that I could be wrong in? <laughs> How long do you have? <laughs> right? But it's a great question to ask yourself. What do you currently believe that you're willing to be wrong in, that that could be wrong? Because asking yourself that question makes you challenge yourself. What do I actually believe? Because a lot of people don't even know what they believe. I think one of the most dangerous questions, if you come to church, one of the most dangerous questions you can ask is, what do we believe? And you get that a lot. But what do we believe? So I don't know what we believe. I know what I believe. So you shouldn't take on a belief just because somebody else has it. You should take on a belief because you've dived in and studied it and looked for it yourself to make it your own. 
So the challenge I have for us this week is just ask yourself that question. Am I open to hearing the truth? And if, you, if you're prone to lying to yourself, <laughs> ask, your, ask somebody you trust and ask, Am I, do you think I'm open to the truth? And see what they tell you. It's a good, it's a good thing to ask. Because all of us are prone to lying to ourselves. But if we filter through scripture, God willing, we'll get the truth. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that we can, we can open your word and, and know it's true. Thank you, God, that, that you tell us the truth. I just pray you give us the maturity we need to hear the truth and apply the truth. I pray you give us the, the strength this week to be able to open your word or to listen to your, your voice, just to be able to change the things in our lives that need changing, to help us to be more like you when we put aside the, the childish things that we have. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you guys stand with us as we close out um, just with this last song? Oh
child of God. God, would you remind us this week, Lord Father, that we are your children. We are held by you, Lord Father, and that we are loved by you, Lord Father. And God, just as we grow, um, Lord Father, that we would grow in you, Lord God, that we would be guided by you, Lord Father, and uh, that we wouldn't be content just staying as a, a toddler, Lord Father, but that we would want to grow in you, Lord Father, want to become more dependent on you, Lord Father, um, and be more obedient to you too. In your holy and precious name, amen. Guys, thank you so much for being here uh, this morning. There's lots of cake I saw down the back that Alex made. Uh, help yourself to tea and coffee and get chatting to someone. And we'll see you next week.